us or will be presenting at our NICUs. Uh, so the clinical manifestations basically depend on the timing of insult uh, to the developing brain and the location and the extent of the brain involvement. In a fetus, these strokes can actually be asymptomatic or they can lead to early consequences like termination of the pregnancy, the neonatal complications including hy hypotonia or delayed cryad birth. So some injury which has occurred in the fetal brain can actually manifest as delayed cry and could not be a result of the delayed cry also. In the pre Stroke could be an incidental finding when you are screening for intraventricular hemorrhages. It can present as multiple episodes of apneas or as focal seizures or generalized seizures as well. In a term child, the most important sign to identify would be a well child having focal onset seizures at around 12 hours of life. Or if a child has seizures and there are focal EG abnormalities, focal asymmetry in their general movements, these are signs of stroke in a term child. 10% of the term children with encephalopathy can have perinatal stroke. Later on, uh, there can be asymmetry in the tone during the first few days to first few weeks of life. And this asymmetry of tone would, in the affected limb, initially actually presents with hypotonia and gradually progresses to hypertonia. Uh, later in the life, by four, five, six weeks, uh, the children start showing early handedness, reduced use of the hand, uh, of the affected hand, and rigidity of the affected hand with persistent fisting. So these are the signs which we are not supposed to miss. Uh, the prognosis and the long term sequelae actually will depend on the extent of the stroke and the location. Mortality rates are very low in perinatal stroke but the long-term morbidity is very high. So uh, around 25 to 35 patient uh, percent of the children will be left with some motor impairment, mostly hemiparetic cerebral palsy. 50 to 70 percent, even if they do not have a motor deficit, like we would, uh, Sir was discussing, they will be left with some cognitive deficits, their executive functions and their memory. In, and even they can even have... Uh, specific learning disabilities like dyspraxias. Uh, 15 to 40 percent can have long-term epilepsy. So unilateral cere spastic cerebral palsy we know is the one of the most frequently observed sequelae. Uh, out of all the symptomatic strokes which have occurred in the neonatal period, 50 percent will develop cerebral palsy, 35 percent may have normal outcome, but this normal outcome is in terms of motor aptitude only. Uh, so, the presentation will define what is uh, our perinatal stroke, how we classify it, how, how to approach, when to order what investigations and what investigation need not be ordered, and what are the management strategies which can be used acutely and for long term. Uh, so, 25% of the arterial uh, strokes in the pediatric population are perinatal uh, are perinatal and the incidence is around 1 to 300 to 1 to 5000 life births. Now this incident uh, because of the definitions which have been used in the study and uh, preterm births are associated with much higher risk of ischemic as well as hemorrhagic stroke. The true incident might actually be higher because we are not uh, getting MRIs, not getting images for all the children who have encephalopathy or all the children who are sick in the NICU. So the actual incidence might be much higher than what is being projected in the studies. So uh, uh, let's try to classify perinatal stroke. Uh, so in the pediatric stroke, uh, sorry. we know that the pediatric strokes can be of arterial or venous origin. Uh, in the art, in in both the categories, we can uh, can be present. They can present in the perinatal age group or in childhood, and in the perinatal in the arterial stroke, perinatal uh, arterial stroke could either be ischemic or hemorrhagic. Similarly, in the venous category, neonatals uh, in the neonates there can be sinus venous thrombosis, or we can have small periventricular venous hemorrhagic strokes. Both these categories. If we are not able to uh, 
ident if you are no if the symptoms are not occurring acutely acutely and the symptoms are identified later on and by imaging we can uh, we can diagnosis that this could be a presumed perinatal stroke that is the incident might have occurred early in the history of the uh, development of the child and now we are seeing only the consequences so what is the definition of ischemic perinatal stroke these are a group of heterogeneous conditions there should be focal cerebral fluid disruption. This disruption could, is due to either due to thrombosis or embolization. The thrombosis could be uh, arterial or venous in origin and this uh, disruption should occur between 20 weeks of uh, period of gestation to day 28 of life. And all this should be confirmed either by neuroimaging or by neuropathological studies. Uh, to classify, like we already did, it is based on. Uh, it could be based on the blood supply, whether it is arterial or venous, on the or on the type of stroke, either ischemic or hemorrhagic. So let's look at this picture. Uh, the right side, uh, uh, of, sorry, your left will depict the venous infarct. So venous infarct could be due to uh, a thrombus in the large cerebral sinuses. This we see uh, that is cerebral sinovenous thrombosis or it could be due to small uh, deep venous infarcts which are uh, causing bleeding which is the peri periventricular small venous infarcts. These kinds of periventricular infarcts are much more common in the preterm neonates as compared to term neonates. In the arterial uh, type of infarcts again there could be lenticular branches which can be involved either secondary to infection or uh, secondary to hemorrhage or they could involve large arteries like the middle cerebral artery and cause arterial, uh, cause classical arterial ischemic infarcts. Age of stroke uh, will uh, determine, uh, age of stroke and the age of diagnosis of stroke will determine whether we label it as a, as a arterial stroke or as a presumed arterial stroke. So between 20 weeks of, weeks of gestation to birth, uh, Events which can be verified either by radiologic features or by neuropathology, these events will be labeled as fetal stroke and they present as chronic static in whose uh, uh, which uh, of which the event had occurred in the fetal age. From birth till 28 day of life, these present as acute encephalopathy in, and they uh, or they can present as focal seizures, altered sensorium, and focal deficits on neurological examination. From 28 day onwards, if these uh, children present as chronic static focal neurological deficit and the imaging shows that there has been a previous infarct, then we label these children as presumed perinatal ischemic strokes. So why do you think is the perinatal period susceptible for, AI, for arterial ischemic stroke? So we know that this is uh, the famous Virchow's triad, uh, for uh, which consists of hypercoagulability, abnormal blood flow, and endothelial injury. In during pregnancy state, we know that it is a procoagulant state, and also the uh, there is high fetal and neonatal hemoglobin and hematocrit. This alters the coagulability of the blood in both the neonate and in the placenta. Also. Uh, the maternal, uh, there is a release of significant amount of maternal cytokines, which makes it pro-inflammatory, causing endothelial injury and making it more, furthermore hypercoagulable. There is relatively slow blood flow and uh, velocity of the blood flow is slow in the placenta. So uh, this pregnancy fulf actually fulfills the Virchow's triad and uh, there can be placental fragments or clots which occur in the placenta which can embolize and cause uh, fetal stroke and we know that there are multiple uh, channels which are available for the uh, uh, for the emboli to uh, reach the fetal brain so either via umbilical vein via ductus arteriosus or through a patent foramen ovary so this is why the perinatal period is susceptible for arterial ischemia uh, what are the risk factors now in the mother primary parity infertility, uh, preeclampsia increases the risk of having stroke by around five times. Uh, already associated thrombophilic conditions in the mother. In the peripartum uh, time, 
increased cytokine storm because of maternal fever or infection, prolonged ruptures of membrane, intrapartum complications. Uh, then a neonate who's a male neonate will have higher incidence because it has been seen that the umbilical cord in a male neonate uh, ha is more, uh, has more pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine release as compared to a female neonate. Abgas goes less than seven at five minute requirement of prolonged resuscitation, early onset sepsis and meningitis, uh, further aggravates the endothelial injury, presence of congenital heart diseases and vascular abnormalities. These are the neonatal conditions. Placental conditions like chorionic villitis, chorionic amnionitis, uh, abnormal placentation, uh, placentation with uh, thrombotic is uh, fetus. Other perinatal factors like polycythemia in the uh, in re uh, requirement of corporeal medicine, oxygenation uh, post uh, delivery will further state. Now, what are the prothrombotic disorders? Protein S deficiency, antithrombin 3 deficiencies, elevated lipoprotein A, presence of APLA antibodies, and elevated homocysteine. Apart from this, factor 5 and uh, prothrombin mutations and MTHFR mutations are also the prothrombotic states which we might have to work up for. When we are to uh, send these workups, uh, require uh, evaluation for all the prothrombotic states. Uh, so now this was a, a case control study in which uh, it was seen that as the number so, uh, in the univariate analysis, we see the uh, risk factors which were increased with uh, higher, uh, which showed higher odds ratio of having a uh, arterial ischemic stroke in a uh, neonate. So, preeclampsia, oligohydramnios, a presence of cord abnormality, primary parity, prolonged rupture of membrane, and chorionitis. But as the number of risk factors increased, the odds ratio of having a stroke uh, increased significantly. So, if there were more than three risk factors identified, then the odds ratio increased to around 25 to 24 uh, percent. So, more the number of risk factors there are, the chances of having a stroke will be significantly higher. So, in an appropriate setting, to manage, we need to first prevent and manage these risk factors early on. In a preterm, uh, the common site of stroke will be the central gray matter as compared to the peripheral white matter in a term child. And risk factors uh, in a preterm uh, neonate will be twin to twin transfusion, presence of fetal heart rate abnormalities and early onset hypoglycemia. This was seen in studies, but apart from this, the other factors also uh, remain the same. So uh, in this graph, you can see that early, uh, during the 28 to, 30, 28 to 32 week, we can see that the lenticulostriate branches were involved much more uh, commonly as compared to the periventricular, uh, as compared to the main cortical branches, main branches or the cortical branches. Uh, so this was uh, about arterial ischemic stroke. Now for cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, uh, the... Um, we know that the uh, there are other risk factors which are involved, like presence of dehydration, uh, presence of this electrolytemia, presence of prothrombotic states. Uh, the incidence of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis uh, ranges from 0.6 to 12 per 1 lakh population. And most common uh, site for sinus venous thrombosis is the superior sagi. And uh, associated, uh, associated infarction in a... Uh, uh, with thrombosis can be 80 percent and most of these uh, infarcts will have hemorrhagic transformations and these uh, will classically be a, a classically seen as hemorrhagic infarcts in the parasagittal region if the deep veins are involved in the striatum and the internal capsule or if there is an intraventricular hemorrhage then in the thalamus and the internal capsule in the hemorrhagic stroke uh, they present mostly as encephalopathy and seizures and are generally unilateral, mostly in the frontal or the parietal lobe. And in the preterm, we know that uh, because of the immature germinal matrix, uh, immature vasculature, there is a germinal matrix hemorrhage and uh, there is a hemorrhage along the draining medullary veins. Risk factors for hemorrhagic stroke are, again, 
presence of fetal distress post term delivery thrombocytopenias uh, associated vitamin k de deficiencies and deficiency of coagulation factors uh, then uh, mutations of the col 4a1 and 4a2 this leads to a uh, fragile uh, cerebral blood vessels and can lead to multiple areas of hemorrhage and can later present as cystic encephalomalacia so if there is a family history of having multiple strokes in during neonatal age group we should always evaluate for this uh, genetic condition then vascular malformations like av mal deep uh, deep av malformation or vein of Ga gallen malformation these can be precipitated during uh, uh, during the birth of the child and can lead to large hemorrhages or they can present as high output cardiac failure. So how do we approach a child with suspected stroke? The appropriate setting, uh, if we know the, uh, in the appropriate setting and when we, uh, when we uh, see a child with focal seizures, with encephalopathy, with uh, uh, asymmetrical movements, with focal deficits, then you take the history of all the risk factors which we have discussed. Apart from that, you send lab investigations, which include a routine uh, CBC with uh, differentials to uh, for polycythemia, for leukocytosis, for associated thrombocytopenias. Serum electrolytes and glucose, uh, PTINR, APTT, and thrombophilia evaluation. Then if you suspect a congenital heart disease, then we do a echocardiography. Not all children, uh, not all neonates will require echocardiography uh, only for an isolated stroke. Uh, imaging to choose and when to do a, a thrombophilia evaluation, uh, we'll just come to that. And if there is a stillbirth and you are going for an autopsy of the then all to evaluate placenta associated allergies. Uh, so evaluation of thrombophilia, it was seen that in 30 to 70 percent of the cases, uh, there was some sort of thrombophilia in the newborn. Uh, the importance is that uh, the inherited protein C and protein S deficiencies, they can be associated with multiple thrombosis and increased risk of further thrombosis. So uh, how many of us think that we should evaluate routinely with a protein C and protein S for all neonates with stroke? Can we have a, like a yes, no in the chat box? Should evaluate, should not evaluate? All need evaluation, some specific. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. No, okay. Right. Correct. So uh, that's right. We don't have to evaluate all children with a protein C protein S. One, uh, that newborns have the of protein C and protein S are not very well defined in the newborns. So they anyways have lower levels, cutoffs are not well defined. And in preterms, the uh, interpretation further becomes, uh, becomes further complicated. The adult levels are actually reached by 6 to 12 months of life. And in case you have evaluated, it should always be repeated because obviously in the acute stage, there is consumptive coagulopathy. So the levels will be low. In case it is evaluated, it should be always repeated. And based on the neonatal levels, you cannot label a neonate having protein C or protein S deficiency, right? So, so many prothrombotic disorders are seen with high frequency even in the general population. And conversely, some infants with stroke uh, have no detectable abnormality in the protein C and protein S. So investigations which can be acutely done if you have a family history or you feel that there is a prothrombotic state can be factor 5 assay, serum homocysteine levels and MTHFR mutation. Routine screening for thrombophilia is not needed in all infants with stroke, right? Uh, okay, let's just... Uh, so this was a prospect study in which one, uh, 42 consecutive infants were enrolled, more than 36 weeks of gestation and uh, uh, 129 controls. And uh, they evaluated for um, uh, association of thrombophilia. And it was seen that thrombophilia and maternal disease 
did not differ between thrombophilia and maternal disease of having a thrombophilia did not differ between cases and controls. So actually probably even having maternal thrombophilia did not uh, increase the risk of neonatal stroke. Uh, so what neuroimaging should you do if you suspect a stroke? What is the first neuroimaging we should go for? Uh, any answers, someone? Which will be the first investigation, first neuroimaging you'll do? Right. Okay, cranial USD. Uh, and do you think it is very sensitive to detect the stroke? It is easily available to us. It is less invasive. Right. It is easily, right, sir. So, uh, it is easily available, less and not very sensitive, but uh, less invasive. And uh, obviously, if a child is having stroke and is encephalopathic, it might be, it might uh, reduce the hassle of getting a MRI earlier. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, cranial USG is the first investigation that you said. Uh, so, the it was seen in this early cranial USG that is between day 1 to day 3 could identify abnormality in 68% of the infants and late cranial ultrasound day 4 to 14 in around 87% of the infants. But uh, as when it was compared with an MRI, the sensitivity of ultrasound to diagnose the lesion was only 30%. So it's not very sensitive. What can you detect in an ultrasound? So what you can detect is that there can be focal uh, increase in the uh, echogenicity, right? So this is uh, this is an example of a, a ultrasound as compared to the MRI. You can see that on the uh, left side, there is increase in the echogenicity of the apparent chyma here. The same thing was is demonstrated as restricted diffusion in the MRI with having ADC correlate. So in a arterial ischemic stroke, it might be able to pick up hyperintensities, although it is not very sensitive. But it is a very good uh, and a very sensitive modality for a venous thrombosis. So presence of or uh, a hemorrhagic stroke. So intraventricular hemorrhage, th uh, ipsilateral thalamic hemorrhages, centrally located hemorrhagic infarcts, these can be picked up very well on an ultrasound. More so if you combine it with a Doppler study. So, uh, you can see this in this image that uh, this is a uh, superior sagittal sinus which is showing good flow, whereas the one below is showing abnormal flow. So when you come uh, when you combine it with a uh, Doppler study, the sensitivity to detect a sinus venous thrombosis increases up to ninety percent, eighty six to ninety percent. So it's a good modality when you want to rule out hemorrhage or thrombosis. A uh, CT scan is generally not, effect, uh, not recommended. One, it is less effective. And also, uh, we are always worried about the uh, radiation exposure. So if we use a CT in a neonate, then better to get a, get a low-dose uh, CT and uh, specifically ask for that in a, uh, from your test, right? Uh, in a plain CT, what you can detect, either focal or if there is a venous thrombosis, then there is something known as a dense triangle or a dense cord sign in a plain CT and an empty delta sign in a contrast CT. So this is the empty delta sign. You can see that there is a filling defect which is present in the superior sagittal sinus. Right. Uh, MRI, when should you order? When uh, do you think should the MRI be sent? Uh, at three months, okay. Any more? Uh, and when can we see the earliest changes on MRI? Okay, uh, so let's. Okay, so the MRI 
Uh, now we have uh, very good sequences and we have very, uh, okay, four weeks, four weeks. Okay, so I think uh, this is one thing which... So the earliest MRI changes actually start appearing at two hours of the infarct. So uh, what are the earliest? Right. So uh, earliest change start appearing at less than two hours of the infarct. What is the earliest change that we can get? So what you get is something known as reduced diffusivity or diffusion restriction. This is the earliest sign which can appear. So even on day one, a diffusion-weighted MRI can show you that there is a stroke or a hypoxia, right? And when after around 24 hours or so, this diffusion, around 48 hours actually, this diffusion restriction starts going down. And what you start getting now are T2 signal changes. So by early, uh, so if you're getting on day one, get a diffusion-weighted MRI. If only one image is possible, get a diffusion-weighted MRI. By 48 to 72 hours, start getting T2-weighted changes. But what happens is the neonatal brain, right? The white matter uh, in a T2 should appear darker. This is a T2 scan. Uh, the, uh, the ventricle looks white. So this is a T2 scan. And this part, the white matter should actually appear dark. But a neonate has unmyelinated brain fibers. And so this area is actually looking white. The signal on T2 after a few days, that is by around a week or so, starts becoming iso-intense to the white matter. So then you start missing this T2 signal change. This is known as the missing cortex sign. So early on diffusion restriction by 48 to 72 hours T2 weighted scan. And later on, we can, uh, we can see that uh, T1 also starts showing changes. Because the neonatal brain is very prone to uh, liquefaction and uh, apoptosis and li liquefaction, gradually it progress into and progresses to encephalomalacia. And those changes can be found later after two to three after three weeks. That is after around by one month of age. Uh, okay. So this, like we have discussed, this is the diffusion restriction and this is its correlate on ADC. So if you want to get a MRI early on, get a diffusion-weighted MRI. Uh, apart from that, there are other sequences which can help us like SWI or the GRE sequence. So this one shows that there are focal areas of uh, hemorrhage in the parenchyma. This was a child on ECMO uh, having focal deficits and focal seizures. So... Uh, we can detect areas of these children. Then uh, these are cortical medullary, cortical uh, veins which are showing uh, increased uh, increased blooming and hemosiderin deposition. So there are small bleeds along the cortical veins because of venous congestion. Then uh, so this we have already discussed early on. There are diffusion changes later on, T two changes, and uh, further later on, uh, there will be T one signal changes. And later on, uh, followed by uh, encephalo cystic encephalomalacia. For uh, when you suspect a cortical sinus venous thrombosis, you should get a MRI with a. And currently, we don't have. Uh, we can use something known as a more flight MRV sequence, which will uh, make our job easier. But uh, there are some fallacies to reporting these in units, which uh, radiologists can help out with. When you suspect a hemorrhagic stroke, ultrasound is a good modality, uh, followed by a CT if urgently needed, or else be a good modality as well. What are the predictors of motor outcome on uh, an MRI? So when you see an MRI, what should you discuss with the parent? You can uh, tell them if the stroke size is large, that there can be increased risk of cerebral palsy. If the restriction is at the level of the cerebral peduncle. It means that it has already uh, started involving the long tracts. So the chances of cerebral palsy will be higher. If, if there is concomitant inter, uh, involvement of cortical, subcortical structures associated with the internal capsule, then the chances of cerebral palsy will be higher. And like I said, if you can see that there is restriction in the corticospinal tract, then there is a uh, uh, then the risk of CPA will be high. So there are some which are available, like the SPECT score, 
transcriptive of the score was around 60 and uh, specificity was more than 50 per uh, predicting poor uh, clinical outcomes in uh, perinatal stroke, right? Uh, how do you treat that? So if for the acute management, first manage the seizures, uh, give optimal supportive care. We need to uh, minimize the secondary brain injury which is being caused because of this infarct. Maintain temperature, glucose levels, fluid electrolyte balance, which you usually do for all your encephalopathies. Whether to not, whether or not to give thrombolytic therapy. So this is one uh, important thing. When do you? Uh, so thrombolysis is not uh, recommended currently in any pediatric stroke because. Uh, uh, First is that the detection of uh, stroke is very late and there are a lot of stroke mimics in all pediatric stroke as well as in neonatal stroke. So thrombolysis is not considered. When to give anticoagulation? If you know that there is an associated uh, congenital heart disease or an associated prothrombotic state, you can give a uh, anticoagulation. And what do you start? Low molecular weight heparin and you start it for three months. If you know that uh, during in the uh, sinus venous thrombosis, if there is a sinus venous thrombosis and there is an associated hemorrhagic infarct and it is not very large, then you start low molecular weight heparin. What it helps with, it limits the propagation of the thrombus, it, it reduces the recurrence of thrombi, it encourages the degradation and improves the vessel recanalization. Uh, what are the newer emerging therapies which are which have come? So first is this uh, EPO uh, erythropoietin study, which is currently ongoing. Uh, it's still enrolling. It was seen that the erythropoietin is actually a neurotrophic uh, material and it is anti-inflammatory, reduces apoptosis and improves the cell survival. So it, uh, it was seen in uh, animal models that it reduced the infarct volumes and it also improved the neurological outcome. So the results of these studies are not, this study is not out yet. Uh, so let's see where it goes. So this is one of the emerging modalities. Then therapeutic hypo, uh, hypothermia. This was uh, a single center study. Not many studies are available for uh, iso, iso for stroke. But uh, in this one study, 15 stroke cases were enrolled and five of them were treated with hypothermia. And those five had decent outcome. Obviously, it is too less to actually recommend anything that it should be or should not be done. Then uh, other uh, newer modalities like intra intranasal stem cell therapy and uh, neuromodulation with transcranial magnetic therapy, they have been tried. So uh, apart from these acute therapies, late therapies, we know that we have uh, there has to be a traditional rehabilitation in the form of stretching, splinting, casting. Uh, medical and surgical treatment uh, for the spasticity which which will uh, which may develop later on and neuromodulation with transcranial therapy has also been tried now now what uh, this uh, uh, current recommendation for hemiparetic cp is use constraint induced movement therapy and now it is all uh, it is now said that what you do is hand arm by manual uh, therapy for children with hemiparetic cerebral palsy uh, so, the, uh, a structured uh, program can be started very early on when you uh, first start seeing early handedness. What are the key? Uh, so, this will be the talk. My key messages are that high index of, index of suspicion should be kept because the clinical features of perinatal stroke are very non specific. Presence of focal seizures by uh, in a well child after 12 hours of life. You should always rule out a perinatal arterial ischemic stroke. Diffusion weighted MRI is the uh, ha, shows the earliest changes as early as two hours of stroke. Cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, the symptoms are often masked and overlooked because these children will have large amount of comorbidities, like they'll be severely dehydrated, uh, will be severely encephalopathic and have seizures. But they have worse prognosis as compared to arterial stroke and need to be picked up early. So ultrasound cranium, uh, with a Doppler should be done early in the course of the uh, child, early in the course of the uh, disease. Supportive therapy in acute stage is the uh, best thing to go for. Also remember that a stroke can present later in the infancy period, even though the insult might have occurred at, occurred at birth. Uh, coagulation profile is not needed acutely in all cases of stroke and 
in neonates with cardioembolic arterial stroke or cerebral sinus venous thr thrombosis, if there is no large tertiary involvement or if there is no hemorrhage, start low molecular weight happening early. Uh, so, always remember that time is brain even in neonate and the therapeutic dosage of low molecular weight heparin uh, in, our, in older children is 1 mg per kg per day, but in neonates less than 2 months, it is 1.5 mg per kg, two, devices, two divided doses. So, this will be the end of my talk. If there are any questions... I would request all the participants to post their question. Ma'am will answer them. Uh, so, sir has asked, if is there any correlation between timing of seizure and brain insult? Uh, so, sir, the hallmark feature which uh, has been described is that in a well child, if there is a focal seizure, then uh, by 12 hours of life or first day of life, then uh, you should consider it to be a, a stroke and evaluate for stroke. I am not able to understand the question if I have answered it correctly or not. So if you can uh, unmute yourself and explain, I'll be more than happy to answer. How long to continue heparin, right? So uh, generally, we continue it for around three months initially. And you uh, repeat imaging, MRI with MRV, look for re and then decide. Uh, if, uh, if there are other factors like associated cardiac disease and you want to continue for long term, then uh, you can actually do a overlap with warfarin and then continue warfarin for the long term. The AHA guideline says that you should continue it until the primary pathology is resolved. So if there is a prothrombotic state, it should have resolved. If there is a cardiac disease, it should have done, right? Then you can stop it depending on the a hemorrhagic stroke, most of the hemorrhagic, if it's a purely hemorrhagic stroke, obviously you will not give low molecular weight heparin. If there is a venous infarct or an arterial infarct with secondary hemorrhagic transformation and there is very less amount of hemorrhage, then you start low molecular weight heparin, uh, repeat the imaging after 5 to 7 days and decide uh, depending on if you want low molecular or not. Is that okay, Sai? And you talk very important. Just wanted to see times four hours, and right. sometimes they are well up to twenty four hours, and after twenty four hours, after forty eight hours, child is okay up to seventy two hours, and right. they develop suddenly seizures after seventy two hours. Right. So is there any correlation between the timing of seizures and happening so, in the brain? So, uh, but Pathophysiologically, sir, basically in a presumed stroke, they can uh, presume perinatal stroke or in a stroke which has occurred early on, they can present with seizures uh, at later stages also. There is no, I don't think there is any correlation. If there is any, I shall read up, sir. I'm probably, I, I'm not sure about that. But most of them, if uh, if they have presented in the acute symptomatic stage, they would have seizures uh, after a period of wellness. Uh, if the insult has already occurred in the fetal brain or in the early stage, then generally the seizures start occurring at around one and a half, two years of age as chronic sequelae. Oh. So uh, they present with focal deficits and later on have seizures. I'm not okay. sure if there is any correlation in the time. Asphyxia is a co-founder? Uh, confounder? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, congenital heart disease, infants. Profile access, we don't give profile access of low molecular weight apparent. If they develop a stroke, then we uh, then we uh, start low molecular weight apparent. Is that okay, sir? Thank you. Yes, Thank you so much, Dr. Richa, for your valuable insights on the topic.
And uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, I would like to invite our esteemed chairpersons to share their thoughts and comments on the, in a, you know, the discussion we just had. Dr. Chandrakanta, ma'am, and Dr. Yeah, Rikash. Richard, it was a very nice uh, and a comprehensive presentation.